a significant number of people are undiagnosed or underdiagnosed with hearing loss, particularly in the adult population. In the pediatric population, there's newborn hearing screening testing and also school screening that results in a greater catchment of patients with hearing loss. In contrast, there really are no widespread accepted screening protocols for adults with hearing loss in most situations. And for that reason, hearing loss in the adult population in particular goes underdiagnosed and undertreated. There's a common misconception regarding cochlear implant candidacy that, a, that an adult has to be completely deaf to gain benefit from a cochlear implant. But in fact, over the years, the criteria for cochlear implantation has expanded significantly. And today, many people with varying degrees of hearing loss might undergo a cochlear implant. My name is Matthew Carlson. I'm a neurotologist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and I'm the medical director of the cochlear implant program here. Today, I'm going to review a recent submission entitled Barriers to Access and Healthcare Disparities Associated with Cochlear Implantation Among Adults in the United States, which will be featured in an upcoming Mayo Clinic proceedings. Uh, sensory neural hearing loss, or so-called nerve hearing loss, is one of the most prevalent and undertreated disabilities worldwide and also nationwide. It's commonly viewed as a benign consequence of aging and less commonly uh, is viewed as a significant health risk that has significant social implications, health implications. On the most basic level, sensory neural hearing loss results in impaired communication. This communication or ability to understand other people's speech often breaks down when there's increasing background noise and when there's multiple speakers. But beyond this most obvious uh, disability associated with hearing loss, there's many secondary disabilities that are that develop from this condition. Most commonly, particularly in the elderly population, uh, increasing hearing loss results in greater social isolation, uh, withdrawal, depression. And more recently, in an article from the Lancet Commission on dementia, it was identified that midlife hearing loss, and specifically untreated midlife hearing loss, might be the most modifiable risk factor for mitigating or preventing later life dementia or cognitive impairment. There's also significant um, safety uh, concerns associated with hearing loss, not being able to hear a fire alarm, a doorbell ring, oncoming traffic, and many significant quality of life factors that are associated with hearing loss, not being able to appreciate music, not being able to hear loved ones or talk to your uh, grandchildren or other family members. So in this way, hearing loss has far-reaching effects beyond just not being able to talk to the person immediately in front of you. The prevalence of hearing loss is, increases with the person's age, and by the age of about 70 to 75, at least half of people have clinically significant hearing loss. For In many situations, it's not just an issue of making the diagnosis of hearing loss, but actually providing the correct or appropriate or sufficient level of uh, hearing rehabilitation. In many situations, people will be prescribed hearing aids and they'll use those for a period of time. But there is often a point at which hearing loss progresses beyond what a hearing aid can adequately uh, rehabilitate. And in those situations, cochlear implantation is often a good option. For most people with sensory neural hearing loss, the problem is loss of inner ear hair cells or cochlear hair cells. And while there's many causes of hearing loss, older age, noise exposure, exposure to ototoxicity, familial disposition, predisposition, and many other things, the end common pathway for almost all these conditions is loss of inner ear hair cells or cochlear hair cells. Cochlear implants are an implant device that have a small electrode or a group of wires that are placed inside the cochlea. The cochlear implant provides very small pulses of electrical activity or uh, of electricity, and those are provide enough stimulation to stimulate the nerve endings and bypass those absent or defective hair cells. So you are able to reinstate sound percepts, once again, to a person who has significant hearing loss. It's estimated that in the United States, there's approximately 2 million people who may benefit from cochlear implantation who are candidates for cochlear implantation. However, there is uh, strong evidence to suggest that only 5 to 10% of people who may benefit from cochlear implantation actually are referred for a cochlear implant evaluation. In these situations, uh, the person will often go uh, continue on with the hearing aid, just not getting the benefit that they need out of it. There's a lot of things that we can do as providers to reduce, uh, to identify hearing loss and also to treat it more effectively. Um, most importantly, on the front line by frontline providers and primary care doctors, implementing some simple screening questions may be effective. It's often that when we encounter a person in the clinical setting, 
we don't appreciate the degree of hearing loss they may have. And that's largely because the clinical setting is an artificial uh, environment. It's quiet. You're looking at one patient or one person and you're speaking face to face. This is in contrast to the real world environment where many of these patients, people have difficulty hearing when there's multiple speakers and there's competing background noise. And in those situations, they'll do significantly worse. So just talking with the patient and feeling like they don't have hearing loss in your clinic visit is not sufficient to really screen for hearing loss. Perhaps better questions are when you're, when the when talking to the patient, you can ask them, when you're in a crowded environment, do you have a difficult time hearing other people? And then particularly for cochlear implantation, considering whether a person might be a cochlear implant candidate or whether they should be referred for a cochlear implant, a very effective screening question is, despite using hearing aids, are you able to sufficiently communicate with other people in real world situations when there's background noise, multiple people talking, or when you're in a restaurant, for example? Another good screening question is, can you effectively hear other people talk when you cannot see their face? And in line with that or paralleling that is, can you use the telephone without captioning systems? Those questions might be good screening questions that primary care providers can use to identify patients who might benefit from a referral for a cochlear implant evaluation. One of the primary barriers to access for patients who may benefit from cochlear implantation is under referral. And that's um, providers including primary care physicians, otolaryngologists, and audiologists, and other people who are seeing these patients and identifying them as potential candidates. One of the main issues with referral is a lack of awareness of what a cochlear implant actually is. And so I wanna give you a brief overview of what a cochlear implant is and what the process is for cochlear implantation. So a cochlear implant is a surgically implanted device that's placed behind the ear. It involves about a one to two hour surgery that has low risk, it's not risk free, but overall the risks are quite low for the procedure. It's an outpatient procedure performed under general anesthesia. And because the, uh, the operative time is relatively short and blood loss is relatively a little, uh, the, the risks associated with the procedure are relatively low. And it's very uncommon that someone wouldn't qualify just because of um, uh, health reasons or having significant comorbidity. So most people qualify for cochlear implantation. Um, the surgical procedure takes about an hour or two. It's an outpatient procedure. Following the procedure, the patient will go home, and then about one to two weeks later, we typically activate the cochlear implant or turn it on. When we turn it on, the patient will hear sounds for the first time that they haven't heard in a long time. They'll able they actually immediately be able to hear very good levels of sound, but it will take them time to understand what those sounds mean for many people. Some people will understand speech very quickly after turning the cochlear implant on, but for other people, it will take several months before they really start to recognize sounds. We, we, one of the most important things when we counsel patients uh, about the potential of cochlear implantation is the idea that it does take time to get better. So on average, a person's growth or performance growth with a cochlear implant is steepest within the first three to six months. And by about a year, they'll, they'll be at a relative plateau with performance with the cochlear implant. Most adults are implanted with a cochlear implant in their poor ear first. And if they get good performance with the cochlear implant, which we would expect they would, then they may be a potential candidate to undergo cochlear implantation in their other ear. There are situations where an adult may have undergo cochlear implantation in both ears at the same time, and that's most commonly when both ears have very significant hearing loss. Um, so again, most typically, the people that we are uh, considering for cochlear implantation are those that say, I've been using hearing aids for a period of time, but they're no longer providing benefit. I've got the most recent updated hearing aid types, or I've had several types in the past, but they're still not getting the benefit. And those are the people that might um, be the best to refer for cochlear implant evaluation. I hope this article in the upcoming issue of Mayo Clinic Proceedings provides frontline providers, primary care providers, otolaryngologists, and audiologists, and other people who might encounter patients with sensory or hearing loss, information about when to identify or how to identify people who might be candidates for cochlear implantation so they can be referred in a timely manner to provide improved quality of life and also enhanced health for our patients that we care for. Thank you. We hope you found this presentation from the content of our website valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. 
There you'll find access to information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel, or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about Healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.